Hi everyone, this is Emily and I'm Dean in North Carolina. And this is Hack a Week Coast to Coast, episode three. Um, why don't we start with news? Dean, what do you have for news this week? Uh, I've been watching some uh, stuff going on on Hackaday. I love Hackaday. There's just such a cool pulse of the maker community on there. And um, the comments are always fun because people start arguing with each other. And <laughs> that's always fun to just be a fly on the wall trolling that and, and reading it. I hardly ever comment on there because the comment thing is still after 10 years doesn't quite work right. But, you know, they're giving it hell. They're really trying to make it work. But anyway... I digress, which I do a lot. Um, this guy did, um, I gotta look on my little notes here. Um, who is this person? He did this thing where he was making um, lifting bodies, uh, lifting body aircraft, which was originally done like by NASA back in the 60s. They were working with um, an alternate way to get astronauts back from space. Maybe you could have like a Precursor to the shuttle, so to speak, which was a lifting body aircraft. Uh, it doesn't really have wings in the conventional sense. The fuselage itself actually acts as part of the airfoil. Yeah. And this thing that he did was 3D printed. And um, he did one that he started out with where he just dropped it from a, a quadcopter. He's got actually it's a like a hexcopter, but a drone. Took it up, dropped it, and it kind of just went into a flat spin and failed. And then he put some controls in it, uh, basically some servos, and it has some um, what would be like ailerons on the back of it. And he went through about three or four iterations of it. It was really cool to watch. It's on Hackaday. Um, it was posted by Lewin Day. And um, I'm trying to find the name of the guy here, who he is, his... Um, YouTube channel is. Give me a second here. Mm -hmm. So up. recently, I've designed a few little this guy. lifting body aircrafts in my CAD program, and then 3D printed them. And which was pretty cool because it's all. If it crashes, you just print it again, and you can change, yeah. you know, what you want on the fly. So he went through several iterations of this. Um, in the 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 uh description here on the video i'll put a link to his his youtube page so you can check it out but i thought it was pretty cool how he just worked his way through testing it out making a couple changes make another model print it out take it out drop it do it again and it actually flew after a while it that's it, cool you know, he went into some flat spins worked out that problem and got it to work so that was a cool one and then the one that i found really amusing was another one where this guy found a garbage disposal on Craigslist, like a three-quarter horse garbage disposal. And he set it up on his bench and he uses it to get rid of his failed 3D prints. And anybody that 3D prints, I'm sure somewhere has like a little can full of, you know, I've got, I got a little box off to the side of failed 3D prints, little bits and pieces of filament, stuff like that. One of these days, I'm going to put it on a giant piece of tin foil, put it in the oven on about 450 and just let it all melt into a piece of art. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And then hang it on a wall. But he's he throw there's a there's like one scene where he takes a little failed benchy you know the little boat that's kind of like the benchmark benchy uh, for setting up your 3D printer and he drops it into the thing and just kind of smashes it in there and, and chunks start flying out the other side immediately it does a really good job of just shredding it up into little tiny bits of plastic so pretty entertaining and at the same time kind of like you know damn you failed print and it's like revenge yeah. <laughs> Send it to the shredder. So that's about it for the the news I got this week. Hey, for for people that are listening to us on um, SoundCloud or elsewhere and not on YouTube, how how can they find the link to this lifting body guys YouTube channel? Since uh, they I'll put it on the Hack a Week website. Um, okay. I'm going to start doing some blogging. I, there's there's a, a link on there for our podcast, but I'm going to start doing a little bit of blogging with some links of what we talk about as of this week, in fact. I may go back and catch up on the ones we've already done, but um, it's just hackaweek.com. If you go on there, you'll find a little blog about this week's um, podcast, and there will be some links about some of the stuff we've talked about. Cool. Uh, so my news of the week... Um, one thing I wanted to bring up, and I don't know if you saw this, there's a new thing out there. It's called the Atomic Pie. Did you see this thing? It's, uh, uh, I don't think so. So, you know, there's like a million single board computers out there these days. Um, and some folks decided to 
like take on the Raspberry Pi. And so this is their like Raspberry Pi competitor. And it's called the Atomic Pi because it uses an Intel Atom CPU. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of differs from a, a typical uh, Raspberry Pi in that, you know, it's an Intel chip. So you don't have to run like Raspbian on it. You can run Linux on it. So that's kind of neat. And it has um it has some neat features. Like it has a like a five watt uh, audio amplifier built in. So like you can really like get some pretty good sound out of it if you want to use it in, um, I don't know, if you want to use it in cosplay or like art projects or anything like it has a built-in amplifier, which is pretty neat. I mean, I think the Pi has a small built-in amplifier, but um, Atomic Pi has like a big one. So, and and it's at like basically the same price point as the Raspberry Pi. It's a, it's 30, 34 or $35. So it's like right there. So I'm kind of curious. Um, I might be interested to play with one, but we'll see. Um, other hardware, there were these, there were these kits that like Google, Google partnered with Target, I guess, to do these kits for kids. And they're like machine learning kits, I guess, kind of. And they're like, there are these Google AYI kits and they had like a, like a computer vision kit. And then they had a, um, a computer like voice kit. And essentially like the voice kit was you assemble the parts and it's, it's a Raspberry Pi zero and like a hat for it that you put together and then it has a speaker and you put it in a box. And so if you're a kid, then you get to make your own like Google assistant out of this thing that you can talk to and it talks back to you. Well, this thing didn't sell, I guess. And so target clearance them out and they were getting rid of them. And so I don't know how many are left out there like in the world, but like basically every target had these things and you could get them for 15 bucks. Um, so like, even if you don't want to use the hat, or the speaker, or even if you're not at all interested in like machine learning or like voice synthesis or any of that, like you get a Raspberry Pi Zero W for 15 bucks with the SD card. Wow. And yeah, so it's a pretty good deal. So uh, I I sent a friend of mine out to go to like, she was at Target and I was like, go look for me because I'm at work. And she went and she grabbed me some. Um, and then my friend Roger went to the Target that's local to him. And I think he bought like five of them. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I think people are starting to like scoop them up, but, um, for listeners out there, if you need raspberry Pi zero W's and you want them for like a pretty good price, um, go look in the clearance section of your local target and see if you can find them. Um, and more personal news. Um, I cleaned my garage this weekend, which was a big accomplishment. Yay. Yay. Um, I'm sure like anyone who who hacks on stuff and makes stuff knows that you just start like accumulating junk and you just get so much junk. And like my garage had gotten to the point where it was like oppressive in there. Like I couldn't find anything. I couldn't I couldn't walk around in there. And I'm I'm getting a new drill press. And so I was like, I need to clean up a bit. And so I pulled all of my assorted bins of like mixed electronics and like I bought a bunch of dollar 20 totes from they're like those shoebox totes. I went to Home Depot and bought like 18 of those things. And then I spent Saturday like organizing everything and everything's like in categories now. And it feels really great. Cause like nice. I have a bin for, for displays and I have a bin for power supplies and I have a bin for wire. And it's like, I don't have to dig through these mass messy piles anymore. And that's going to just be awesome. Um, and then the last bit of news, this is also personal news, but I was pretty excited that I passed 400 followers on my YouTube channel yesterday, which was pretty cool. Yeah, um, that's that's pretty, happening pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty small potatoes for YouTube, but it was still exciting because I had like good 60, like two months ago. So that was cool. That's very cool. Yeah. It's ramping up pretty quick. I mean, you got, you got videos that are short, easy to watch They're And the last one, uh, I like how you left the audio in there going <laughs> really fast, like cartoon audio and then it slows down in the parts that really matter where you want to get, you know, something across and then just speed it back up again. Yeah. Or just if I'm like whining and like, I felt like including my whining then I slowed it down for that. Too. <laughs> sure. Cause that's just part of the game. So yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> um, all right. So what's next? Hey, are we, are we on fail of the week? Are we doing fails? Oh yeah, I got I got some good fails. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. yeah, why don't you start? Let's see your fails. Well, I've been coming up. You know, I had this idea for when I go to Maker Fair, which is 
wow, a couple of weeks. It's like yeah. more than I think, you know, and I'm, I've still not got my presentation totally together. I've got to get on that. Um, I got this idea where I want to do something with like a, a video camera mounted like to the side of my head, just something like a hat I can wear, glasses, the, without the lenses, whatever, you know, think Google Glass, but the anti-Google Glass sort yeah. of thing. But I wanted to find a camcorder small enough where I could put the lens on the side of my head and maybe on the other side, the, the CRT, the LCD, the whatever it is. And the idea is that when I'm looking at someone or something, you're seeing what I'm seeing over here in this. And if you put a lens on it, you know, it's similar to what you did with the, you know, the, the thing with the bones that you've got with the uh, CRT. And so I had uh, a Sony um, little camcorder, a little DVD one. I tore that apart. Problem with it is everything is super, super tiny surface mount mm -hmm. stuff. And in playing around with it with the power supply the other day, uh, as we'd mentioned before in the last podcast, how Sony is so proprietary with their little power supplies. On one side of the plug is two terminals. Then there's one on the other side. The one on the other side is positive. The okay. two on the other side are negative. But each one of them has to have a negative to work. Oh. Um, Why? Why would you do that, Sony? You know, but anyway, I was messing around with that last week and getting a little frustrated and not really thinking what I was doing there and tried different polarities. And of course I fried something on the board Ugh. and it wouldn't work, but I opened it up anyway. But as I got into it, I went, this is just too crazy to try to even think about troubleshooting. It's like, um, I'm not real familiar with, you know, the terminology of how small the little surface mount components get, but mm -hmm. the guys were like a millimeter across. They were so tiny all yeah. over the place on the board. So pretty much just scooped up that whole mess and threw it in a drawer with other optical failed camcorders. <laughs> and then I got out the other one that was a VHS-C camcorder that did have a little LCD oh. uh, display for the eyepiece. Messed around with that. And I figured, okay, let's just take out the outside covers. Okay, it still works. Then I unplugged all of the mechanism for you know the transport for the tape. Mm -hmm. And then it wouldn't work. It wouldn't show any kind of oh. image, and it started making weird noises. And I'm like, great. Somewhere in here, the way this is built, it's it's looking for this other part of its body. And when it's not there, it just goes. There's some little microcontroller. It says, "Sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna work. Yeah. I can't, I can't find my tape transport, so I'm not gonna make an image." That one ended up in the bin. And ah. so well, it's like, well, okay, what? So what am I gonna do here? So I got on eBay and I started digging around on eBay like, all right, super cheap, dirt simple little piece of crap camcorders. And I found this little one called the Kobe Snap. And okay. it's got like a little 2.4 inch LCD, a uh, little CMOS sensor in it. It's got a four time digital zoom, 640 by 480 AVI, has a whopping 32 megabyte internal storage. Nice. <laughs> Uh, it can take an SD card. Who knows what size? Probably not very big. But point being is it's very hackable, it looks like. It's a super tiny little thing, and it's got an LCD that flips out off to the side. So you got to figure all there is is a little ribbon cable with maybe eight or ten leads on it. Yeah. And so I'm not sure how I'm going to rework that because it's got like that little 2.4-inch LCD. So I'm thinking maybe I can put the thing, the, the lens part and all that, on the side of my head and then take the main board and maybe run some wires from that, tuck it in a shirt pocket or something, and then take the LCD and maybe just stick it on my badge, my, my, um, you know, maker participant badge that you get oh, when you go there oh, as, as a oh, presenter. I have an idea. I have an yeah, idea. Let's hear it. All right. Remember, remember like old time doctors, they wear those headbands with like the light on the front. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like right on their forehead. Like yeah. you should totally have the LCD like right on your forehead like that. <laughs> you know, my forehead. That's a great yeah. idea. I could do that. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I've got I've got an old um, grinding shield band out in the shop, and the grinding shield parts crack. So maybe I could just hack that into yeah into something and and mount it on that. That's a good idea. And then yeah. so it's got this big LCD stick on my forehead. <laughs> Or just stick it on my forehead. <laughs> yeah, you can do that too. Just like oh, literally, just, just some super glue. Hold it on there. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> 
if we were local to each other, I have I have one of those doctor's headbands with the light, the old school ones. I would let you have it. Um, I've seen some of those at a few, um, you know, my wife Lisa and I all the time are hitting up junk stores, antique stores, things like that. Some of them I call junk stores because it's not really antiques and what I would think of as collectible yeah. high dollar antiques. It's a lot of junk, but they're fun because there's lots of junk in there. Yeah. And uh, I've seen a few, I've, I've passed up a couple of them. Um, should have grabbed one, but that's a good idea. I may do something like that. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's my fail. And um, in that, I realized, you know, some stuff about, well, you know, sometimes components need to be all there for yeah. other parts of the components to work. There was, um, as I was doing this, I was thinking that this is like, I think it was called Munzing. There's this, there's this electronics tech guy I, th I, I think I'm remembering this right. I think his last name was Munts. There would probably be some comments about this. Oh, oh yes. I think I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the guy who would pull out coupling capacitors yeah. on circuitry. He would be like, okay, we got this circuit. It all works. Now let's see how many components we can yank out to make it cheaper to build. And yeah. it still works. And so he, it's called Munting. You know, you just start pulling out coupling capacitor, decoupling capacitors, um, you know, and, and try to eliminate as many other components that are unnecessary and see if the thing works. And I guess a lot of that was done in TVs, um, cheap TVs that were being built in the 70s and stuff. They had like a minimal amount of components in them. And that was one of the things that, um, <laughs> it's namesake, <laughs> pretty funny. I, I think that like most of us would be honored to like get a verb out of our names by the time we die, right? Like oh, yeah. I'd be pretty yeah. happy if like someone made a verb out of my name, especially <laughs> if it was like, Having to do with hacking. That'd be so cool. <laughs> the, the Velasco effect, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you put bones in your circuit. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe right. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, my fail of the week, it's not a new fail, um, but while I was cleaning out my garage and like organizing, I ran across like all of my old failed electronics projects, which like, I don't know why I have these. Like, these things like probably date back to high school. And so like they're 20 years old. Like, I don't know why they're still in my junk, um, but they were there. And so I wanted to show you these things. I'm gonna, I'll do screen sharing. Um, Cause one of them is kind of hilarious. Um, <laughs> let's see, screen one, share. And when I should, can you see? Yeah, you can see my screen. So um, there we go. Um, why don't you take a look and then you can describe for oh, yeah. I've got a few of those where you know the the, the solder looks a little lumpy and yeah. the, the homemade PCBs are yeah yeah kind of weird. So, <laughs> look like there's a couple of a, uh, a magic marker. You know, some of the first yeah. ones they ever made were that way. They were with the the little marker that was the resist. And in fact, a sharpie will work. Yeah, you just go over it a couple of times and you can actually make it with a sharpie. And I've done a few of those. So yeah. Yeah. Had some like yeah. that. I kind yeah. of like the way they look though. They're they're just like that that one looks like all the components are kind of like at a at a rave and they're just all dancing and right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and this one with the solder, like for people that are, are listening to this and not watching, like it's a it's an archer perf board from Radio Shack, and they're just like these thick, thick, thick ropes of solder just blobbed onto the board. They almost look like weld. Yeah, it's like because <laughs> I was like, I don't even know, maybe 13 or 14. And I somehow I got one of those Forrest Mims books, you know, those um, Forrest right. Mims, yeah. like engineer. I, totally. I can't yeah. sleep on those things. I had a, I, I built everything in that one yellow covered one that's got all the stuff with op amps and yeah, uh, all the crazy stuff you could build. Yeah. Yeah. So I got one of those, I think probably from Radio Shack. And I wanted to build one of the things that was in that book. And it was it was the light listener. And it's like a thing and it uses a it's basically has an op amp and acting as you know as an amplifier and it has a photo cell and a speaker. And so like the photo cell is just picking up light that you point this thing at and then it plays it as an audio signal. I really wanted to build one of these things because I thought this was the coolest thing. Like I can listen to light. But I didn't. I had no idea how to do any of this, and I didn't have like I didn't have a soldering iron. I didn't have like solder for electronics. I like didn't have any of the stuff I needed. And like my dad, I asked him like, "Well, how do you solder?" And so he gave me his stuff for soldering plumbing. Um, Acid core. 
Yeah, I don't even know. Probably like the board looks pretty corroded when I pulled it out. So probably, yeah, it probably was. It's a, the yeah. first mistake. So, I, out too. <laughs> I was using his big soldering gun, like the kind that you have to hold the trigger and has the little light at the end. And well like, yeah. yeah. And like one of those thick like plumbing solders. And like, I just could not like get this stuff right. And I just was piling more and more solder onto that board. Cause like, you know, like you're supposed to like, people do these little like traces where they just connect the, the, the little solder pads and make lines. And I was trying right. to do that and it was just a disaster. And, <laughs> but I can't, now I like, I can't bear to throw that thing away because like, it's just such a hilarious disaster and it's my first electronics project. So like, I, I think I need to do something with it because it's just neat in just an awful way. You should take all of those boards, I think, and put it in like a nice little frame of some sort, at, you know, that you can come up with. Like a frame where the glass stands off from the background, oh, maybe yeah, yeah. a half inch or more, and just and, and just mount them in there and like black felt or something. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, like make like, a little shadow box for them. Yeah, yeah. they're pretty right. really cool. You know, I've got a few kicking around, and um, there's one drawer of just a, of stuff that you know fails, and then some of them were projects I did that was just a quickie thing, and it's like. Okay, that was done. It was a hack week video. What do I do with this thing? If I kept every one of them, it would just be nuts. So a yeah. lot of them end up in a box and then I'll pilfer them for parts later. So it's like there's these cadavers with parts missing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are, are we ready for surprise hack? I think we're ready for surprise hack, right? I'm ready. I'm ready for that. All hack. right. So I'm going to do a screen share and show this thing to you. Um, and as as typical, like just you'll take a look and then uh, tell us what you see and think. Um, so where's my screen share here? Come on, you. All right, screen share, screen one, share. There we go. Okay, there we go. Hmm. Okay, it's not coming up again because I. Oh. Yeah. Let's see what's going on here. All right. Um, can you see my screen or no? Okay. <laughs> a litter box? Yeah. And so what, what's there is like a like a beam brake sensor and a Raspberry Pi on top with a uh, with a breadboard. And this is a project by Claire Pollard. Uh, you can find her on YouTube or on Twitter at the Tufty. That's T U F T I I. The Tufty, and this thing is called Moo's Litter Box or or Pooper Visor. You can find her at uh, Pooper Visor on Twitter, and so <laughs> she made a tweeting, a tweeting litter box. <laughs> so when uh, <laughs> when her cat, which I assume is named Moo goes and does a do, then uh, we get a tweet. And so the latest tweet from nine hours ago was X marks the plop. <laughs> <laughs> so she's evidently come up with like some random text lines that it'll generate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like the one that's like poopity poop, poop, poopy, poopy. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great. That is so brilliant. I love stuff that people do where when a thing happens, it tweets. I've seen some stuff like that before with animals, but that one is the best. Yeah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I I, mean, I kind of want to make one for my own cat, um, but he, he he poops outside a lot, so I don't think it would work that well because it would happen every few days. But um, I thought that was great. Like I've never seen anyone like tweet their cat's poo before. So that's awesome. pretty funny. <laughs> And, and I'll segue off from that onto a comment you made this week on Twitter about farts. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little about that one, and then I'll I'll, I'll kind of talk sure. about my idea. <laughs> so I was at um I was at my parents' house on Sunday visiting them, and um, I was I was brainstorming with my mom because I was like, oh God, I have to go home and make dinner. And I usually on Sundays I like to make um I like to make a meal that I can eat for like several meals because like I don't want to cook food on like Monday night and Tuesday night and Wednesday night and have to come up with a lunch for myself as well. So usually I make like a big meal. And my mom was like, oh well why don't you make lentils? And I was like, oh God, like 
yeah, lentil soup is good, but it just makes me fart all the time. And then like that segued into my mom complaining about coworkers at, that, that she works with who fart. And then <laughs> <laughs> she started talking about like, first she started talking about like underwear that absorbs like the fart smell. But then she was like, well, what if you could just have like a suppository that you put up your butt, <laughs> that, like just lets the part the fart pass through and it like takes the smell out. And I was like, you mean like a butt plug full of like activated carbon? And she was like, yeah, exactly. Like, why don't they just make that? So that like, you could just wear that and then you won't bother anyone. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. And I was like, I guess like, like not only would it get rid of the smell, but like it would keep your butt open. So like you wouldn't even make a farting sound because you're just kind of like blow right through the carbon, right? <laughs> Never thought of that part of it. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no sound, so you know, there's no. Uh, it's just like <laughs> there it goes. So she got very excited, and she was like, "Why don't you patent that?" Oh, that's <laughs> easy. Never that's a patent along, but then I started thinking, I have a 3D printer. <laughs> I should 3D print one of these and just make it and see if it works. So I'm kind of like tempted to try it out of curiosity. But yeah, that was my mom's, my mom's. Farting butt plug idea. That's great. And as a side note, don't you love it when people say you should patent that and they have no idea what it takes to get a patent? Absolutely. Right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, well, if you got like five grand to burn to just like make the application happen, you know, yeah. If you're lucky, you can go from there. Uh, but <laughs> it's funny because that got me thinking about it. And then somebody else posted on those, there, there is underwear out there that's available. It's got activated charcoal in it, but from what I understand, it's good for about 20 or so washings and then the activated charcoal doesn't work anymore. As soon as I saw it, I thought, you know, this is kind of a joke because the activated charcoal is going to fail at a certain point. It doesn't have, mm -hmm. you know, a lifetime of forever. And then my crazy hacker brain went, well, wait a minute, you know, I got this big fish tank where once a month I take out the filters and I've got these little packets of activated charcoal that I open up. They haven't been exposed to the air. So they're all fresh and you dump it into the filter cartridge thing and you close it up and you put it back in. It's good to go for another month. So why not make underwear or pants for that matter with a little pocket in the back and you just buy the, the activated charcoal for your fish tank. <laughs> and if you have a flatulence problem, then, you know, you just, fill up your little pocket in the back of your butt <laughs> with the activated charcoal and go to work and be as flatulent as you want. <laughs> it's a fart diaper. It's, it's all good. It depends <laughs> I mean, it's for farts. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should patent that. <laughs> you should. I have a friend who's a patent attorney, so if, I'll, I'll connect you guys. He'll write, your, he'll write your application for you. <laughs> Kickstarter. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Yep. Maybe we can um maybe we can team up on that and we can sell the uh, underwear and the butt plug as a Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you donate um what like you know hundred bucks, then you get the butt plug. If five hundred, you get a vibrating butt plug. Okay, that's not good. Yes. <laughs> yes. I have some vibrating motors I took out of a cell phone that I can use for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, see, this is what happens when you put two hardware hackers together. <laughs> You never know what's going to come up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. in, um, <laughs> in more um, reasonable life hacks, <laughs> uh, what kind of life hacks do you have this week? Um, some stuff at work. You know, I mean, every week on these old cars I work on at work, I, I do stuff like on cars from the 50s and 60s. And some of these things, you can't buy the parts for them. And it's not like you can just, you know, jump on eBay or Amazon or whatever and order a door latch for a 1953 MGTD Roadster. Uh, and so I was having some issues with this one. And those cars actually have wood in them all over the place on the really? floorboards, um, in the sheet metal on the door frames. The, the sheet metal is folded over and inside it is a wood um, piece of, the, of, of a framework that screws actually go into and hold stuff together. That's wild. And then, so there will be like a, a little piece of metal that is screwed into the wood with some big screws. And then that piece of metal has some little carriage bolts in it that are anchored in place that then another screw goes in and holds another part on. 
Okay. And, but over time on this door latch, um, you can imagine that, you know, the wood eventually gives up and starts to sure. get loose. And, and it's oak too. Most of it's oak. Mm. Um, and so you have to get in there and tear things apart and figure out what to do about it to solve the problem. And sometimes the wood is start to split. Um, maybe the hole where the screw went is so stripped out over the years, people have put bigger and bigger screws in as time goes by. And so now you've got this thing that even a number 12 screw won't fit into. So one thing I've done to fix those, um, and on other projects too, when you've got a piece of wood where a screw goes in and you can't really replace the whole piece of wood, you just drill it out and you put a dowel in with some, uh, Elmer's glue and push it in flush, let it dry. And then you drill a new hole and put the screw back in with the original size screw that it had back into that wood dowel. You basically have replaced the wood. That's yeah. one way of doing it. And then on this one piece of metal this week that I had, it was all broken away. And to fabricate the entire piece of metal would have been really tricky because it had some nuts that were held in place in it. So I got it over on my little welding bench and I, you know, there's a, there's a place where a screw held it on, but half of the hole had just broken away. And so it was mm. like, I just flop around and went in. So I just put a washer on where the hole was and welded the washer in place. And it basically replaced that piece of sheet metal and created the hole I needed for the screw all at the same time. Um, and it solved the problem. I put it all back together and everything worked okay. The latch is fixed and the 1953 car has a door latch that works again. And uh, these are like suicide doors too, by the way. They open at the front and hinge at the rear and they're they're really weird. These cars are, are by no means like uh, any kind of a, a safe car to ride in. So if you get in an accident, you are going to get hurt. There is no safety features back then. It's just how they were. They were made for English country roads, um, driving no more than 40 miles an hour most of the time because the roads are skinny and, and windy and narrow. And that's just what they were built for. And so yeah. they, uh, they're engineered really, really simple. So, you know, usually the simplest solution is what, what takes care of it. Oh, and by the way, the other one that I did, the uh, signal light thing mm -hmm. on the other MG that, yeah. um, the the toggle switch I put in had a plastic handle on it, cheap plastic handle. He broke uh, it. He broke uh, it. Every time he used it, he broke it right off. Oh God! So I put another one in it this week. It was back at the shop, and I put one in. It's like a good old school, like you know, like you know, kind of like a Bakelite style housing on it with a big old metal um, toggle switch. You know, with the knob at the end. Yeah. Like a real toggle switch. Toggle switch you could you know operate a million times, and it's going to be yeah. okay. So that took care of that. Well, all right. Well, um, my life hacks. Um, so I alluded earlier to the fact that I'm getting a new drill press and it's not a, um, it's not a new drill press, but it's new to me. Um, the machine shop here at work got themselves some actual new drill presses. And so they wanted to get rid of their old drill presses. And these things are like beautiful, beautiful pieces of machinery. They're uh, Delta drill presses from, I think he said 1956 or thereabouts. Um, super, super, super heavy duty, like wonderful, like awesome, like sea green color. Like they're they're sculpted, like the it, they're just gorgeous. And they offered me one of them. And um, they offered it to me like three weeks ago. And I've been trying to figure out like, how am I gonna get this thing home? Because it's big and it's heavy. And there was a guy at work who like, he has like a side hustle of that he has a truck and that he will take stuff to people's houses for them if they buy stuff from campus. And so he offered to take this thing home for me, but he had been flaking out and like two different times, no, three times I was supposed to meet up with him. Like once he was supposed to come to the machine shop with me and twice we were supposed to like take the thing home and then he just didn't show. And I was like, man, screw this. Like, yeah. I don't wanna, yeah. I don't want to rely on anyone else anymore. And like, I could go to my parents' house and borrow my dad's truck, but that's kind of a pain because I have to leave my car over there and then I have to take the truck back to them. And so I was like, forget it. Like change of plans. Like I have a Honda fit. I can't fit the drill press in there all in one piece, but I think that drill press will come apart. And so yesterday I went out of the machine shop and I took it apart 
into its like constituent sections. So like the base and the post and the table. And then I don't know if you call it the head, but the head thing with like. Yeah, that's it. It's usually referred to as a head. Yeah. So I took that all apart into pieces and like as pieces, they're like relatively manageable. And so I was able to like heft three of the pieces into my car and I took them home and I got them reassembled. And tomorrow I'll get the head and I'll take that home in my car and I'll put it all together and I'm gonna have a new drill press and I'm pretty excited. And uh, I was pretty excited I was able to get it home in my car because I really thought I was gonna have to get a pickup truck and um, I didn't. And sometimes it just goes to show that if you just take a step back and like think about what you're doing that you might find a new solution to your problem. Um, and my so it's like a, a promo for the Honda Fit. It's a great car. I mean, it's, they got they got more. They have you know, it's end space. It doesn't look like there's that much room in them until you try to cram a bunch of stuff in. You go right, oh, right. A lot of room in this thing. <laughs> yeah, if you if you fold the back seats flat, like there is a ton of room. Yeah. And if I were not so tall, because I'm like six three, if I were not so tall, like shorter people can camp in them because you fold the back seats flat and then you push the front seats all the way forward and then fold them. They don't go completely flat, but they go flattish. Mm -hmm. And then a twin air mattress will fit in there like, <laughs> from front to back. Wow. And, um, so people will do that. And I would do that, but like my head will be on the dashboard. So it's kind of not feasible for me. But yeah, they're super cool. Um, if it was just a little longer, I guess it would be a station wagon at that point. And I'd love to have a station wagon. But yeah, that I'm pretty happy with that car. CRV at that point. Yeah. Or right. Uh, the element i had an element for a while that thing was incredibly cool it's just a yeah. giant box you know yeah i love box cars um yeah. my co-worker he um he just had a baby and he's he drives an mgb gt to work every day um and his wife is like hey that's cool but you're not taking the baby in that thing <laughs> so <laughs> she told me he has to get another car he can keep the mg but he has to get another car and so he's been looking around for something and he asked on that website jalopnik he wrote in they have a like a feature called like what car should i buy or yeah. you like write in and ask for advice and he asked and like they gave him like a list of five things he should get and one of the options was a scion xb like the first generation and like he was hating on it so much because he thinks they're just hideous but I love those cars. Like I, I love that they're a box, and I, I love that they're like proudly a box. Like they don't first, try to hide it; just a box. First brand new car I ever had was a an NXB. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the first one I ever actually bought a brand new car um, after going through probably about 150 other cars that I bought and sold, fixed, and usually made money on. <laughs> but that was the first one that uh, was brand new, and Did you I, like it? I traded it in after a while. I got a XA. Uh, which was kind of sporty and fun, but too tiny. And then I went to the Honda Element, had the Honda Element for I think six years and sold it. Okay. Kind of wish I still had it, but um, basically I was trying to get out from under a loan that I went upside down on because of the um, the Great Recession, as it's called. <laughs> yeah, I went upside down about five grand on that car, but it was cool though. It served me well. It was you know I don't, I'm not complaining at all. That car was great. Um, it moved me across the country and brought it with me from Hawaii to where I am now. And great car. You could stuff a ton of stuff in there. I went shopping when I first moved back to the mainland, and I bought a washer and a dryer and a desk, and they all fit in the back of that. Oh. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. It was nested, you know, everything was nested yeah. together, but I actually fit everything in there. Yeah, Have you seen the um the camping conversions they do to the Honda Elements? They're kind of yeah. like yeah, they're like those old um VW Westphalia vans. Yeah, I, I had one of those too. Have one of those. Yeah, they're great cuz you just, you know, on a Friday you're like, "Hey, let's go camping for the weekend." You jump in the car and go. Everything's already in there. Yeah. You don't, you don't even pack anything. You just leave it full yeah. of groceries all the time. Yeah. It was the best. Yeah. yeah, I had one of those that I used to drag race. <laughs> really? A Westie, huh? It, it was hot rotted. Um, it wasn't really a real West Poly. It started out as a regular van, and I turned it into a camper. Okay. Went to the junkyard, bought all of the stuff that was in a camper, and then put it in mine, turned it into a camper. And then I built a hot rod engine for it that probably made about 125 horsepower. And I used to take it uh bracket racing drag racing where you you run a qualifying time you pick a time that you predict you're going to run and then you can't break out of that time you can't go any faster than that time 
And so the object is now you go up against somebody next to you in the other lane and, and you have to cross the line first without breaking out of your predicted time. So it's about consistency. But it would go 72 miles an hour in the quarter mile in 18.1 seconds, which is phenomenally fast for a camper bus. Yeah. <laughs> full, of, full of groceries. <laughs> it was fun. That, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I miss my bus. I had a 69 VW bus for, I don't know, like eight years. No, it only really ran for like two years because, um, not because it broke down, but because I had the bright idea that I was going to like fix it up and restore it. And um, I just took it all apart and I just never got it back together again. So. Oh, that is a story that goes on all over the place with cars and motorcycles and everything. It's, you know, the I'm going to restore it. And then a year later, it's like, wow, what have I got myself into? I'm just going to sell it. Yeah. 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 It a lot. Yeah. You know, I have had 17 Volkswagen buses. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Kind of an they're, they're like a lot harder to find these days. Like when I had my bus, like I would still see them just like trashy buses driving around. And that wasn't that long ago. They're and not cheap. like, yeah, like you don't, you don't see them around. And when you do, they're generally like really shiny and fancy. And like someone probably paid like $40,000 for that stupid thing at like an auction or something. That's crazy. What what started that was the the twenty one window bus a couple of years back that went for two hundred thousand something at an auction. Oh yeah, the and, Barry Jackson auction. Yeah, up. and now every person with one in their backyard that's full of rust holes and the engine doesn't run, and it's basically just junk. Thinks it's worth eight grand and they put it on Craigslist and that's what they ask for it. And I just like shake my head and go, I'm never gonna find a bus again. <laughs> Bad. Uh, Sucks. So what do you got going for projects this week? Uh, projects, projects, projects. Um, so um, my power supply, um, I, I picked up this power supply last week. Um, it's an HP Harrison 6255A power supply. Also um, known as a badass power supply. <laughs> yeah. Super like super heavy duty, like vintage old power supply. Um, I found it in the e-waste and it had a big sticker on it that said kind of works. And I was like, well, I'm, I guess I'm gonna have to fix this thing. And I, I didn't know what was wrong with it. Uh, I looked at it over the weekend. I, I didn't see anything obvious, but on Monday I took it to the hacker group our, for our weekly meetup. And uh, my friend Roger and I looked through it and I found a burned up diode. I found some other things. One of the traces, I don't know if you saw in the video, one of the traces had gotten so hot that it lifted right off the board and it was just floating in space but the trace had not disconnected. So it like still had continuity. So it was like, well, something went wrong with this thing. And I found a diode, it was a Zener diode, like tucked into a little corner that had just completely burned up. And so it was just, it was like a short. So I took that out and replaced it. And like, that was it. Like all I had to do was replace that diode. And now the thing works again. Um, it, it can do zero to 40 volts and it has current limiting, which is great. Cause I don't, this is my first like, power supply that can do current limiting. So like, I just like couldn't do things before. Like if I wanted to like run a laser diode, like I couldn't do that unless I like built a constant current power source. But like now if I just want to check and see if the laser diode works, I can just put it on the power supply and like crank it up slowly and see if it turns on. Um, it needs a little work still. I think the potentiometers are dirty um, because when you turn the knobs, the the current and the voltage should just go smoothly up. And it, it, it does like in aggregate, but it like kind of jumps around at points. So I think they're just dirty and I need to clean those with some contact cleaner. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Like it's a nice heavy duty power supply. Um, and it was free. I mean like free, but for the cost of a single diode. Um, and some sweat hauling it across campus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, just my sweat because it yeah. was like a hot day and that thing is like 40 pounds or something. Well, you know, when we were talking about that and it was that you said that it was really heavy of, you know, when, when I hear that a piece of electronics like that is heavy, the first thing I think is, oh, then it's a good piece of electronics because yes. it's got some really big ass transformers in it. So it's going to carry a lot of current and, you know, it's built to be a real, real piece of equipment. Yeah. But the thing about that, when diodes like that go bad, um, on a circuit too, or any component like that, and you fix it. And by the way, it's it's got two sides to it. It's got duplicate boards in it, right? Yep. There's, there's, yep. So I'm assuming you went to the other board to get 
to get the number and the value or whatever of the diode you needed to replace because that one looked pretty fried. Yeah, yeah, there, there was no way to measure it. It, it. it actually like had cracked into two pieces, like yeah. it carbonized in the middle. Um, yeah, um, but also, you know, I had the, um, I had the schematic, um, Rue Moore, oh. who we've talked about before on, on Hack a Week Coast to Coast, he found right. the schematic. And so I was able to like, even if I had not been able to check the diode on the opposite side, I had the schematic that said what it was supposed to be. That's cool. Um, the, I don't have the correct component in there. I put a Zener in there, but it was like a funky, it, it wanted a 4.2 volt Zener, which like was not something I had on hand. And um, I, I don't want to order one stupid Zener from like Mouser and pay shipping yeah. on that. <laughs> right. um, and at Fry's, a Zener diode is like, I don't know, a dollar fifty, and so Tata Electronics, maybe they have it. You check with them because you can order. Yeah, maybe so. I you should know, check they got, that. They got like a five dollar minimum order, but still. Yeah, but I probably need other things too. Yeah. So in any case, I put in a six point two volt Zener in place of a four point two volt Zener, and like it sets the reference voltage higher, and the reference voltage is now at six point two instead of four point two. I asked Rue to explain to me like what that reference voltage is being used for, and like. He started giving me a really complicated answer, and then he was just like, "Oh, don't worry about it. It's probably fine." So, yeah, essentially, you know, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But the weird thing is, is you all you have to ask the question, "Why did it fry?" And yes, probably because somebody pushed too big of a load, is what I'm thinking mm -hmm. on that side of the uh, of the power supply. They were doing some testing on something. And it might have had some back voltage going on, and it might have been the reverse current in the diode couldn't handle it, and that's what blew it out. Yeah, probably because I've seen that a lot on car stereo amplifiers back in like the '80s when I was doing that for a living. I was working to a car stereo for a couple of years, and if people hooked it up backwards, then they bring it in. It's like my amp's not working right. I think I hooked it up backwards. You open it up every time, it would be the little protection diode. Mm -hmm. and that's why it's there and it's not there to survive it's there to you know sacrifice itself when you hook things up backwards and so then you have to go and replace it and you know it's just a big rectifying diode you pretty much can just throw anything in there and it's going to work again yeah <clears throat> but i always wonder you know why components failed when i fix a device and it works and like yeah but why did it fail is it some other some other component in the circuit is that's bad and it's going to fail again and so you just work with it and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, and, and I was wondering about that too. And so um, one, of, one of the members of our group suggested before I powered it back up, he, he was like, you need to check all your power transistors because it has a bunch of power transistors in those TO3 cans. Check all those, check all your big electrolytics. So I went through all those and checked them. And like the really nice thing about having it be that like twin power supplies in one is that like you just check like the ones on the bad board and then check the corresponding one on the good board and like, right. you know, oh, same value, cool. So like surprisingly everything was fine. Even the all the electrolytics were even like still in range. They weren't even like out of whack at all. That's um, cool. Yeah, so I don't know, you know, it. so this was something that students used probably and like, you know, students, they, they're learning and so they they screw up sometimes, so. Who knows? Like the power supply was built in like sixty nine or seventy, and so it it was being abused by students for fifty years. So right. at some point, someone did something to it, and if there's something else bad in the board, like it'll probably show itself eventually. But sure. like I let it run for a while, and then like I unplugged it, and then I I touched the diode to see if it was hot, and it wasn't. So like the new diode's not getting overheated at least yet. So. That's a good sign. Yeah, I'm thinking it was just a mistake somebody made somewhere, yeah. you know, especially with that trace. That's another, the trace that got hot. Um, yeah. That's another clue, too. And yeah, I have seen that happen before where they lift right off the board, but they don't entirely fry, but they get hot enough to pull away from the resin that's holding them to the board. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So that was one project. And then um, the other project was, um, so Roger and I were working on our vacuum fluorescent display project again, and we were in a troubleshooting um, phase this week because like the thing works, but we just had like a funky thing going on where the, there was one, one of the digits, not a digit, one of the segments, if you turn it on, 
like everything in that grid would come on, but if you turn it off, everything would go off. And like, that was a lot of like, like who knows where this problem is? Is it in the code? Did we wire up the logic incorrectly? Like we couldn't figure it out. Um, but on Monday we were poking around and like, we didn't get anywhere, but Dave was like, well, what's going on? And Roger described to him the symptoms and he said, check on this pin of this chip and see if it's connected to this pin of that chip. And we did. And like, lo and behold, like there was a connection there. And I was like, well, what the shit? Like, so we're looking for a solder bridge and there's no solder bridge. And like, I get the loop out and I'm looking really close to see if there's like something tiny we can't see. There's nothing. And I'm like, what the hell? Like there's nowhere in this circuit these two should be connected. Um, and we didn't know what to do. And so I was like, all right, screw this. Like we can't figure out where it's connected. It's probably like probably a bad perf board that we built it on that has like an internal connection. So I just took the wire snippers and just snipped that leg off the chip because the leg isn't supposed to be used for what we're doing anyway. So just like clipped it off and it's still like the leg itself is still connect, like still shorted to this other pin. But now the chip itself isn't connected to its own leg. So now the thing works and it works great. And so we're going to write some. <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So now um, we're going to start like coming up with like what we want this thing to display. And um, Roger had a cool idea, kind of a cute idea to use the display to animate it, to look like a pair of eyes looking around. And he, like surprisingly, just using like seven segment displays, you can like, and we have eight digits, you can make like some expressive looking eyes where they can squint and they can look to the left and they can look to the right and they can get mad. And so I think we're gonna do that. And then I have this idea to make it into um, a thing that I'm calling the death clock. Because when I asked on Twitter, like what should we do with this thing? Everyone was like, make a clock, make a clock, make a clock, make a clock. And I'm just like, oh my God, people, like there's a million VFD clocks. Like God, I'm, not, really. I'm not making a clock. But they kept insisting, and I was like, "All right, screw you all! I'm making a death clock." And this thing, <laughs> you're gonna like put your finger on like a capacitive touch point, and then all it's gonna do is like read you back like the day and time you're gonna die, and it's gonna be at random. But based, on your your capacitance. <laughs> based on your capacitance. Yes, because <laughs> um, the display has like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday on there. Oh yeah, then, perfect. So you got day, yeah. you go right down to the day of the week. Yeah, so it'll just like pop up like Thursday, 11.35 a.m. <laughs> it'll be different for everyone. That's a good one. Yeah. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I wanted to bring something up before I forget. Um, right before we went on air, um, one, of, one of our mutuals on Twitter, his name is, I hope I pronounced this right. His name is John, John Shuch or Shuch. Oh, it's John, John Shook. Shook. Okay, yeah. John John Shook. Yep. Um, so you know who he is. Yeah, I've met him. He's out in Arizona. He's a cool guy. Cool. So he tagged both of us. He he's been looking at some auction site and he's he wants to buy some track lighting because there's a bunch of track lighting on this auction site and it's he is an auction nut. That guy buys more <laughs> stuff on auctions for <laughs> screaming deals. It's crazy. <laughs> I had a friend like that. She used to go to police auctions and buy stuff. Yeah. Um but he wants to buy some track lighting and he he tweeted to us, there has to be something geeky cool that could be made out of track lighting track with or without fixtures, looking at auctions of with miles of track and hundreds of fixtures. And wow. then he, went, he tagged both of us. So he wanted us to see if we had any ideas for what someone could do interesting with some old track lighting. So I wonder if you have any thoughts. Well, you know, the first thing I'm thinking is it's like, do you treat them like pixels? So you cover yeah. the entire side of a building with them. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, huge project there. You can first yeah. find a building. You got to find somebody willing to let you put them on the side of the building. He could and put then, them on the roof of his house and then make like a, a display that like pilots can see. Yeah, yeah. End up on Google Maps. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that. Uh, that's a that's a thought. I don't know. God, track lighting. Tons of track lighting. Yeah. So the thing is he finds these things where there's just like a million of one thing, you know, and what do you do with it? And um, he was recently in some salvage place and he walked down this one aisle that was full of like voltmeters and oscilloscopes. 
and he tweeted something like exercising restraint <laughs> it was like oh my god yeah the, the, i used to live uh in in arizona and phoenix he lives in mesa okay and uh, we both know about a place that used to be there called electronics emporium and it was the best i mean i'd just go in there and find crap and just get inspired just by the junk that was around you know to, to take it home and see what you could do with it you know it was fun but they went away to uh, yeah. so much stuff now it just ends up getting ground up and mm -hmm. you know, there's places too where you're not even allowed to take it i mean it's you know you go to some of the the landfills and they have like an e-waste pile and you try to grab stuff and somebody runs out and says no you can't take that well, why not i'm going to recycle it yeah it, you know but they won't let you it's too bad it is too bad. I know a guy who actually like stocks those e-waste sites and like once the stuff goes in, like they, they all seem to have a policy that you cannot take anything. Yeah. But he's, like it's like a thing. It's like some people go to the swap meet on weekends or whatever. He goes to the e-waste site and he just hangs out outside the entrance because people have to park and they have to carry their stuff in there. Is he catch them before they even dump it? Yeah. And he just watches people as they walk right. in. And he's like, <laughs> Hey, like, can I please have that TV? Can I please have that computer? And most yeah. people are like, yeah, I don't care. I, don't, I just want it gone. Like, whoever takes it can have it. So that's, that's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Um, he was suggesting I do that. And I was like pretty tempted. But um, like John Shook, I'm trying to exercise restraint because I have yeah. way too much junk. And like, the last thing I need to do is start hanging out outside e waste sites. Like, then at that point, like, I'm going to end up on that show hoarders. So yeah. and you got to go buy more bins, bigger. Right. Bins. Yeah. Right. And start renting a, a storage unit or something. Right. Um, so what are your projects? What are you working on this week? Um, well, we haven't got too much time left, but just a little bit quick about, I haven't had a lot of time to work on projects, so this is actually okay. Um, the mechanical tremolo, I actually did start to get some stuff done on that. Um, I, I did a drawing the other day in um, SketchUp, which I really like using. It's pretty simple, and um, I'm very used to it. And I've learned a couple little tricks in it to get it to do things that are kind of weird. Um, that there's no real simple answer for if you went to Google how to do it. But I've learned how to fudge the thing a little bit, and I made like this little thing, which is the 3D cam that's going to move around and do the little thing with the. Uh, potentiometer. Basically, it looks like a cone that you took the tip of and skewed off to one side. And cool. um, yeah, so I printed out one of these and it fits on this little motor with a hexagonal shaped shaft on it, a little gear reduction motor. So no real trick on how to anchor it to the motor, just push it onto that and it's good to go. And then the next thing to do will be to um, cat up the uh, parts that are going to hold the switch and i want to make some sort of a mechanism with like a sector gear where i can just turn a knob and it will move that 3d cam back and forth in relation to the potentiometer to increase or decrease the depth of how much it's modulating the signal with you know the movement of the of the potentiometer so that's coming along a little bit at a time not a lot of time to put into that stuff these days with all the busyness i got going on but at least you know a little at a time it's fun. And the 3D printer thing is kind of neat because, you know, if I do a project where I'm printing parts, I got some time to just sit down, make the part, um, go put it on the SD card, let it rip, walk away. And while I'm doing other stuff, I've got a project going, you know, yeah. on the 3D printer. So having that thing around is so great. And upgrading recently to that um, Creality. Uh, CR10S. I love that thing. It does a great job. It's a big step up from my old printer, which still works fine, which I took to work. And I've been using it at work to print little tiny parts for cars, um, like things that hold visors in place, stuff like that, little tiny um, boxes. Yeah, it's cool. I didn't even think about that. That's pretty yeah. super handy. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a neat addition to the shop. It's just there with its own little laptop that I can uh, use to, you know, sketch up some components if I want to. And Print them out, handy. Yeah, awesome. So that's about it. That's about all I did. That and my fails with the camcorder this week, but it was fun. You know, I mean, I'm at the bench playing around, and even if it's a fail, it's still fun, it's still enjoyable, and I laugh at myself. And I actually shot video of all of it, so I may include that in the final build of whatever this is going to end up that I build for Maker Fair. You definitely should. People yeah. love to see fails. So yeah. 
yeah, you know, just do the fast forward part of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it for this week, right? We're about out of time here. Yeah, we're at about an hour. And um, once again, fun, always stuff to talk about when you're a hardware hacker and maker person like us. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, I am at Hackaweek on Twitter. And I am at MLE underscore online. Don't forget to mention your YouTube channel. That's right. You can find me on YouTube at Emily's Electric Oddities. Really cool channel with, um, I, I love your uh, your little um, promo thing that you did and, and your intro to the video. It's just so totally retro, weird. <laughs> Thank you. 70s thing. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. You have, you have this really kind of neat talent of capturing that that kind of a sense of, I guess, conjuring up, you know, like a 60s, 70s vibe, which is before you were even born. And I see it, I'm like, well, yeah, that's cool. I used to see that on TV. I mean, <laughs> that was the world I grew up in. So yeah. Yeah, well, well done. Golf, golf Thank you. Golf. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, um, so you can find us on all kinds of podcast outlets. We're on a bunch of them now. Just go searching for them, but mostly on um, SoundCloud and here on YouTube. And uh, check us out on Twitter. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep on hacking. Bye. Bye.